Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Tom. I'm the minister at Earls Hall Baptist Church, and we welcome you to our morning service. As we get near to the summer holidays, we finishing we finish today our thoughts on the Ten Commandments, and today we think especially about our response to them as we live for Jesus today. We're live this morning and next week is going to be hosted live where our focus is going to be on Open Doors and Graham Walker who has shared at the church in the past um, on behalf of Open Doors is going to share about their work. So we look forward to that next week and to hearing what Graham has to share about the work of Open Doors around the world. In two weeks time and for the remainder of August our Sunday services are going to be pre-recorded. This is to allow those who have been working in the background over the last four and a half months to have a very well-deserved break. The services are still going to be on at the same time and we'll still be able to gather as we have been through Facebook and God will still be able to speak, challenge, bless and equip us. But the services themselves will be pre-recorded. But I hope you're still able to join us. Some of us are able to go away on holiday and some of us are having staycations, staying at home and we won't be getting away. But whatever you're doing over the summer, I trust that you know God's grace and God's blessing towards you. Some exciting news though, because it's the start of the summer holidays, this is happening starting tomorrow. So that's all sorts starting tomorrow. Please do tune into that. It's on every day this week. And just, yeah, if you know anyone who's in primary school or uh, primary school age, please do let them know that all sorts is happening. It's happening live on Facebook, not from the building as we, we would normally do, but you are very welcome to join us for all sorts this week. Lots to look forward to. As we begin, shall we say the words of the grace together? Now the grace is a verse, it's one verse in the Bible that's found at the very end of 2 Corinthians. It's the last verse in the book there, verse 14, uh, the very last chapter of uh, 2 Corinthians. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now we often say the grace at the end of a service it's uh, sometimes how we end, isn't it? But it's good to be able to say the grace as we start to worship together. Because as we begin to worship, we want to trust that God's grace will be with us. That his love will be with us. And that even though we are not able to be in the same building together, we are able to fellowship with the Holy Spirit at work in each one of us. And we're going to sing about God's amazing grace just now. Let's worship God in song. <laughs>
You are forever ours, Lord God. Good to be able to worship in song together, isn't it? And what powerful words, amazing grace, my chains are gone. Well, as we conclude our series looking at the Ten Commandments, Katie's going to speak to us all. Good morning. We've finished exploring the Ten Commandments, so today I thought it would be good to see if we could just remember what they were. But to give you a clue, we've got some pictures made out of Lego, just to give you a clue for each one. So they're all mixed up, they're not in order, so see if you can guess which one is which, and hopefully, while you're guessing, you can just remember all the things that we've been learning about over the last few weeks. you get on. I hope that you got them all right. For me over the last few weeks I found it really helpful because it's helped me remember that the things that I'm thinking and feeling and the, what, my attitudes towards things and what's going on inside my heart is as important as how I act on the outside and the things that I actually do. I wonder what impact looking at the Ten Commandments has had on you. Shall we pray? Our Father God, thank you that you know us so well, that you love us so much, and that you want the best for us, and that you know what is the best for us. Help us to come before you. Help us to be honest with ourselves and to ask you if there is anything that we need to look at in our own hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, Katie, and uh, thank you for that excellent Lego summary of the Ten Commandments. I'm not sure I've ever thought of Mace Windu as being my father, but good to be able to uh, think about the Ten Commandments in that way. Katie's just prayed, but it's good for us to be able to spend time together in prayer. Our worship lives aren't just uh, sung music or songs that we sing along to, but also what we pray for and how we uh, spend time with God and so we're going to spend some time in prayer and I'm going to hand over to Andy who's going to lead us in prayer this morning. Over to you Andy. Good morning Tom and good morning to all of you. We've all probably faced times when we wonder if our prayers really do make a difference. You may be going through such a time right now. The past few months have reminded us that we live in a broken world one in which events don't always run as they should or as we would hope. One in which we and the people around us and those whom we love experience hurt and pain and suffer heartbreak. 
Yet these past few months have also shown that this is a world in which astonishing acts of kindness are displayed and compassion is experienced. We have seen and heard of people who go and who have gone to extraordinary lengths to do good and to show love. It is into this broken world that Jesus came to show us the extent of God's love for us. He endured hardship and pain in order to draw alongside those who felt lost and forgotten so he could tell them that God loves them and would always be with them. And he calls us to join him in this mission, to be part of this great plan of showing the world how much he cares. To trust him as we reach out to others and to trust that no prayer of concern goes unheard or loving act is ever wasted. In my quiet time earlier this week, I heard these words in the call to prayer. I rejoice in God's mercy today, joining in the ancient praise of all God's people in the words of Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Imagine that for a moment. The Lord bends down to listen when we pray and he hears our prayers because they come from our heart as a sign that we care. Isn't that amazing? Listen too to these words of the pastoral of the Irish bishops. Come follow me. What can I do? Respect that question. Trust that you, one man, one woman, can do for God what otherwise would not be done. Trust that some people will hear the gospel of Jesus, that some who are in need will find the touch of human love, that others will find a listening ear or a voice in their poverty. Only because you have chosen to give God a central place in your life. It is not just your work, your choice, your decision. You choose because you were chosen. You choose because in the heart of your desire to love, You have found the heart of God searching for you. Let these words give us encouragement and hope as we come to our time of prayer this morning. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers. You know far better than we can understand that this world is broken. You have told us to take heart in knowing that you have overcome the world and in your promise that a time is coming when everything will be made new and pain and suffering will be no more. Until that time comes, however, you have called us to be part of that amazing mission of representing you to this world. A mission that calls us to draw alongside others in their circumstances of life, to assure them that they are not on their own, and to use our prayers as a form of reporting into you of what's happening and to ask for your assistance. As ever, Lord, help us to stand ready to be the answer to the prayers we ask, and to not lose hope, but to continue being with someone and to ask for help on their behalf, even when we have nothing to give. Today we pray for people who are in need of help and support and who face difficult situations that are causing them anxiety and uncertainty. We also want to thank you for answered prayer for those whose health or circumstances are improving. So we pray for Eileen and Mary and for Jean, for Michael and for Martin. We pray for your peace, for the might of your presence and for your hand of love. We also join Marcia and Ray in thanking you for the improvement in their well-being. Lord, in this moment, I also bring to you the names of people I know who need to experience your love and goodness today. Wherever they are and whatever they are doing at this moment, may they feel your touch on their lives. And Lord, give us the passion to continue to bring our prayers to you and to draw encouragement in knowing that when you hear our voice, you bend down to listen. 
we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andy, for leading us in prayer. There's a couple of things that um, came in last night uh, for our prayer, and we're just going to pray and carry on in that spirit of prayer as we pray for a few other people just now. Lord Jesus, we want to pray for Alan and Christine Hill following Alan's mum's death on Wednesday. We pray that Alan especially and the family would know your love and your comfort surrounding them just now. We pray too for the, uh, Christine and Alan's brother-in-law, Keith. Um, we pray, Lord, that as he is to face surgery, Lord, that you would be with him, be with the family. And Lord, I pray that he would come through that surgery well and that it would be fully successful. And we pray too this week for the funeral of Tom Mitchell. Uh, we pray, Lord, for Christina and for those who are close to him. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would watch over Christina and bless her, Lord God. Lord, we thank you that we are able to pray. And we thank you that you are able to listen. And not only that, that you are able to respond. And so as Andy has prayer, prayed, so we now echo. We ask all of these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, having prayed and considered God's grace and compassion towards us, let's worship God now in song. Everyone needs compassion. It is a truth. It's good to be able to have sung that song of praise. Our Bible reading this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 22 to 29. The passages that follow on immediately from the giving of the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to hand over to Emma who's going to read this to us. So it's Deuteronomy 5, 22 to 29. Thank, Thank you, you, Tom. Good morning, everyone. 
Our scripture reading today is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 22 to 29, and I read, These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in the loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountains, from out of the fire and the cloud and the deep darkness. And he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When you heard the voice out of the darkness, while the mountain was ablaze with fire, all the leaders of your tribe and the elders came to me, and you said, The Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty, and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speak with them, but now why should we die? This great fire will consume us, and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you. We will listen and obey. The Lord heard you when you spoke to me, and the Lord spoke, said to me, I have heard what his people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts will be inclined to fear me and keep all my commandments always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Here ends our scripture reading. Oh, thank you. It's uh, good to be able to hear those words, isn't it? We have heard the Ten Commandments over the past few months. We have heard how each one is clear and dealt with the people who had just left slavery, how each command was part of God's formation of his people to know who he is and to know how to love God and to deal rightly with each other. We've also seen that Jesus affirmed each command as given at Mount Sinai, though not necessarily the additional layers of law that were applied on top of the Ten Commandments. And we saw that was particularly true around the Sabbath regulations. But the story of the giving of the Ten Commandments doesn't end as the Tenth Commandment ends. The people of Israel are still at the foot of the Mount, at Mount Sinai. They have yet to go and live in the way that they have been shown in the commandments. It's like God has just given them the very best seminar on who he is and how to live for him. And now they need to go and put it into practice. Having received the commandments, the people now need to put them into action. They have heard, now they must obey. The commandments were given on tablets of stone by God, as well as audibly through Moses and audibly from the mountain to the whole people. But they are to be written into the people's lives and into their hearts. The commands are given from Mount Sinai and the mountain is covered in smoke and with fire and God's presence is powerfully and visibly and audibly there. They hear his voice. The people had fled Egypt. They had been led already by God in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, something that's going to carry on in their journey in the desert. So they know that fire and cloud speak to them of God's powerful and protective presence. At the mountain, God shows himself simultaneously in fire and in dark cloud. And they hear his voice. They absolutely understand that the God who has given these commands is the same God who has redeemed and saved them. And having heard the ten words, these ten commands that's given a focus to the people to put God first in every aspect of their life, how to live in moral consideration of all people, 
the people now get to live for this God in obedience to what he has shown them. They have been saved. They have been redeemed from Egypt and from slavery. They have been given a new identity as belonging to this awesome and powerful God who has saved them. So how will this people respond? <laughs> they were saved before they ever heard these commandments. But how will they, they respond now that they know that there is a way of life that is to be lived and that it is to be lived for the saving and powerful God? And as we consider their response, we're going to ask, how does that help us today as we seek to live for Jesus? Now, to help us answer this, the book of Deuteronomy helps. This is the record of the people of Israel recorded by Moses. Well, except for the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy where Moses has already died. But Deuteronomy seems to have almost entirely been written by Moses. And Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy reflects a little on the story and experience of the people. And it seems to be recorded just before the people are about to enter the promised land, about 40 years after the events of Mount Sinai. And yet Moses clearly remembers the details of his time at Mount Sinai and of what happens after. And that's what uh, Emepha has read to us. <laughs> you would remember this, I think, wouldn't you? I mean, if you had an experience like that, fire and cloud and God's voice and God's presence, I think you would remember. I wonder what's your most vivid memory of your life lived for Jesus? Is it the day you came to faith that you recognised Jesus was your Lord and Saviour? Is it the day that you were baptised? Is it the day that you received God's Spirit in a powerful way? Is it the day when you were able to exercise your gifts and your skills and love and humility and grace? Is it the day when you were kind instead of angry? Is it the day that you were gentle instead of harsh? Is it the day that you were loving instead of spiteful? Is it the day that you were patient instead of quick to lash out? Because our life lived for Jesus affects us. Well, for Moses, the experience of Mount Sinai was huge. And Moses had known some pretty spectacular experiences. There's the burning bush with the voice of God speaking to him. There's the staff that he is told to take by God that as he throws on the ground turns into a snake and as he picks up again turns back into a staff of wood. There's the instruction that he's given to go to Pharaoh to let God's people go. There's the power of the plagues, the experience of raised expectations, the reneged promise as Pharaoh changed his mind time and again. There's the freedom from Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground, and now this mountain of fire and cloud. God's audible voice, not just to Moses, but to the whole people. Yes, Moses knew some moments in time that were powerfully full of God's presence, but this Sinai moment is etched in his memory. And he tells us of two sets of voices. Moses records for us two sets of voices in the passage that we've heard read. We hear the voice of the people as they respond and we hear the voice of God as he accepts their response. So I want to think about these two words, the peoples and gods. Let's think about what the people share. This is from verse 24. The Lord our God has shown us his glory and majesty and we have heard his voice from fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now, why should we die? This great fire will consume us and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us 
whatever the Lord our God tells you, we will listen and obey. Let me just pick up on two key lines there um, from verse 24. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. And then right at the end at verse 27, we will listen and obey. The people represented by the elders tell Moses to go and deal with God because otherwise they fear that they are going to be burned up in God's holy fire or killed through hearing God's powerful voice. In other words, they are scared. They are afraid of God. And they say, hey, Moses, you go talk to God. We're, we're right behind you. Way behind you. Fire and darkness and the voice of God. And they're scared. And we may think it doesn't make sense for them to be scared. They're but they're so scared that they just don't want to hear God speak anymore. They, they want to hear what God has to say, but they want God to speak to Moses first. And then Moses can pass on to them what God says. They, they don't want to hear God's voice anymore. They don't want to hear his voice. I, I wonder, have you ever prayed for God to speak to you, to speak clearly to you? Because here the people have got a fear of hearing God speak clearly. Francis Schaeffer, a 20th century theologian, says that God is there and he is not silent. And he's right. But sometimes we, as church, as people living for Jesus, struggle to hear God clearly. And when we are in those moments, we're desperate for God's clear voice. But here at the foot of Mount Sinai, the people have heard God's clear voice. And they're actually scared to hear more. It's like the Ten Commandments are enough. You, God, you speak to Moses. The people don't want to hear God's voice anymore. They fear his voice will lead them to destruction. But they are happy to have God speak to Moses. And they say, we will listen and obey. Yes, God is awesome and God is fearfully powerful, but he is also the amazing God who has freed this people from slavery and has been showing them how to live for each other in the Ten Commandments and how to honour God. And so their fear is a sign of respect. So that's how the people have responded. So how does God respond to what they say? How is God going to receive that sense of fear and that they don't want to hear his voice in the same way again? God says this, I have heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. That's uh, verses 28 and 29. So God has heard the fear of the people, but he's also heard their desire to hear more from him, but through Moses. They don't want to hear God's voice anymore. And God says that everything that they have said is good. God accepts that they are afraid and he accepts that fear as a right response to their particular experience. There is the voice of God. There is a mountain that appears to be on fire with darkness swirling around it. And at the foot of Sinai, as the mountain is swirled with darkness and fire, God has truly got his people's attention. He knows that they know who he is. And God knows that he has told this people how to best live to honour him and to honour each other. And God hopes that they will be obedient. He hopes that the people's hearts will be inclined to go on in that fear, that respect, and to keep all his commands so that it might go well with them and their children forever. You see, keeping the commands is going to make the people put God first in their lives and then put each other ahead of themselves. 
God hopes that the people's hearts will be inclined to fear him and to keep all his commands so that it might go well with them and their children forever. So, while we may find it odd that they are afraid to hear from God themselves, they are a people who are willing to hear from God through Moses. And so the people give us an example of a right and true attitude of God's people who have been redeemed and saved and have known a very powerful experience of God. They are in awe. Fear in this sense is a right respect for the awesome power of God and in it there is a desire to obey the one who has saved. As people living today for Jesus, we don't often have that sense of fear, I think, and respect for God. Our experience has not been one of redeeming waters. Well, maybe we've been baptised, so we've passed through waters, but we haven't passed through sea on dry ground. Or fire and cloud guiding our path. Or the voice of God giving clear instruction for life and how to live in this way. For the people of Israel, God had proved himself powerfully. His holy presence has been shown in powerful physical ways. His holy and righteous presence, his voice show that despite his power, he's willing to draw near to his people. God's presence revealed in this way gives the people a real and a right sense of awe. One of the commentators in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Raymond Brown, says, those who honour God shrink at the thought of grieving him. God is to be loved as well as feared. And that's what the commands teach. Now, as church, we have talked about the fear of the Lord recently when we spent time looking at the book of Proverbs. There, we were told that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear is understood as an awe and respect for the powerful and saving God who has chosen to be our God and that his people be close. And if you do not have a sense of fear as you consider the 10 plagues that were set upon Egypt, the saving of the people by the death of the firstborn sons of those in Egypt, but the protection of those whom God had chosen, or the waters of the sea being parted for Israel, but then falling back on top of the Egyptian army, then we miss something of God's power and of his grace towards his people. God miraculously and powerfully freed his chosen people from Egypt. Yet in Jesus Christ, God has opened up a way for all people on this planet to look to Jesus, to seek for forgiveness of sins and to move on into a relationship with God. Today, we are able to be God's people only as he has made that possible. It is God who has worked his power for salvation of us in Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection and ascension. Neither you nor I did that. Whilst we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. And Jesus chooses to call us friends as we seek to live for him. But Jesus is still the God we serve. He is still the God who has saved. And we should have reverent respect for our friends. So yes, God is to be loved and God is to be feared. And Jesus calls us friend. But we need to hold those things in tension with each other in our hearts. Jesus calls us friends. He calls us brothers and sisters with him. But he is also our awesome, powerful and amazing God. Do you remember the time that Jesus was in the boat with his disciples? He was asleep in the back of the boat and the wind got up and the waves began to crash. The wind howled and the rain came down. And the disciples were afraid because they thought they were going to drown. And Jesus is woken. And at a word, he calms the storm. Huh. And then the disciples are terrified. They're terrified. They're afraid. Because they realise that this man who is in the boat with them, 
was God, because only God could stop a storm like that. The disciples loved Jesus and they called him friend, but they had that right sense of respect for Jesus in amongst that. Our Saviour is our friend, but our Saviour is our Lord. Our Saviour is our God. Our Saviour is our King. Our Saviour is the Word that was at the beginning of all things. Jesus is our friend, but he's an awesome and amazing friend. So having thought about the Ten Commandments and having heard Jesus' summation of the Ten Commandments, and we've looked at this a few times, Jesus' summation of the Ten Commandments in response to a question was this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. Here we have Jesus' summation of the Ten Commandments. Putting God first is a priority. Putting others ahead of ourselves is a priority. We are to love God and we're to love those around us in the world. We are to live with the hope of God's kingdom being at work with his miraculous power, his saving grace, his healing and his comforting available to those who will turn to him. And we are to be a people who continue to have a real and true respect for our God who has done all this for us. Yes, Jesus is my friend. Yes, Jesus loves me, but he has shown me how to live for him. And my friendship for Jesus should consist of a respect and an honour for him, for all that he has done. And that should spur me on to have a respect and a care for those around me. The people of Israel heard and then they said they would obey. Jesus still speaks to us today. He speaks to us through the Bible uh, through the gospel stories of Jesus' life. And as he speaks, do we hear? Are we willing to listen and obey as the people of Israel were? Will we be faithful to this God who has saved us in Jesus Christ? Will we live for him? Will we put God first and consider others better than ourselves? Shall we pray together? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses and to the whole people of Israel. We thank you for how you didn't take any of those commandments away, but how you affirmed their worth for us in honouring God and in how we consider those around us in the world and how we honour them. Lord, we pray that as we seek to live for you, Lord Jesus, we would know the wonder of our relationship with you. You are our awesome God and our King forever, and you call us friends. And we thank you and praise you for that. So, Lord, let us live for you. Let us put you first in our lives. And let us love those around us with a love that has a right fear and respect and wonder for all that you can do. And let us have faith that can move mountains. Amen. We've thought a lot about grace today. We are saved by grace. Nothing that we have done deserves the salvation that we know in Jesus Christ. There was nothing that the people of Israel had done that deserved their freedom from slavery in Egypt. God worked his gracious act in the past and he still works that gracious act of salvation in people's lives today. And so we're going to sing of God's grace. This is amazing grace. <laughs>
as we close our service, as we began it, shall we say the words of the grace together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I'll see you soon.